Welcome to History Hack. If you didn't know by now, we are the revolution. That means we're sharp, witty, lots of fun, but it also means that we're essentially the peasants in Les Mis huddled round a table in the corner of the bar with no money. If you enjoy the show, please do support us. We have a Patreon account by which you can donate a small monthly sum in appreciation of what you're hearing. Alternatively, we have Ko-fi in which you can just do a one-off donation as a thank you if you particularly enjoy a certain episode. Either way, we massively appreciate all of your support. Hope you enjoy the show. Hello, you gorgeous lot. Welcome to a brand new mini series from the lovely people at History Hack. I'm Charlotte White, but you can call me Charlie, and this is Misunderstood. I'll be joined by a stellar lineup of guests who are each going to help me explore the lives of women who've been dealt perhaps an unfair hand by history. They may not all be great women who changed the world, they may not all be good women but they will all be interesting. Some have been forgotten, some ignored, some misrepresented, but they have all been misunderstood. Francesca Peacock is an author and arts journalist whose writing credits include articles about books, art, culture, and all the good things in life for The Telegraph, The Times, Spectator, and Prospect, amongst many others. Her first book, Pure Wit, The Revolutionary Life of Margaret Cavendish, is published by Head of Zeus on the 14th of September, and she joins me today to discuss its misunderstood subject, the Duchess of Newcastle. Hello, Francesca. Hi, it's so lovely to be here. Thank you so much for having me. It really is just wonderful to have you, and I'm very excited for this chat. So 2023, this year, marks the 400th anniversary of Margaret Cavendish's birth and the 350th anniversary of her death, very neatly and conveniently. Who was Margaret Cavendish? So if we start at the beginning, she's born 1623. What what kind of world is Margaret born into? Yeah, so this is such a good place to begin. Um, And as you can probably tell, I did try and time the book to come out with that anniversary. (laughs) Um, So she's born in 1623 in uh, like a former monastery called St John's Abbey in Essex. Uh, So part of it still stands, most of it doesn't now, uh, crucially because... um, at the Civil Wars, uh, her house eventually gets blown up, which is a key uh, clue as to what type of world she's born into. So she's the youngest child of a very royalist, wealthy, but not particularly aristocratic family. So they had money, they'd been given land via political appointments, they'd known people close to the throne, they had jobs, lawyers, politicians, but they weren't like, um, they weren't one of the big famous aristocratic families in England at the time. Um, But she wouldn't have like lacked for anything. And she was the youngest child. So her father died pretty soon after her birth and her father had been married to her mother for ages before she was born all of her siblings were mostly grown up and she had this rambling childhood where she was kind of allowed to do whatever she wanted which crucially was a lot of reading a lot of writing in what she calls her baby books and a lot of making and wearing her own clothes um, and she's born into this family who are very, very royalist. And when she's born, that doesn't seem like too big of a problem. But by the time of the 1640s, the English civil wars begin to go from disagreements, political disagreements, to eventually all out civil war. And her family are very much at the centre of that. Um, so there's some brilliant historian whose name I've just forgotten now. But um, he writes at one point that one of her brothers opened the back gate of his garden and walked out into the pages of history one day when her house gets stormed by a group of um, parliamentarian townspeople who didn't like the fact that the Lucas family were royalist. Gosh. And her, I mean, one of her brothers is involved in one of the sort of most iconic executions of the the (laughs) Civil War after the siege of Colchester, if I'm right. Yes, so this is quite like a famous story. So it's Sir Charles Lucas, and he is executed after um, the Royalists have lost the siege, they've lost it all. And um, Royalists would say that he was he was executed unfairly, and parliamentarians claim that it is actually legal at the time. So the laws are a bit murky about what you're allowed to do to captured uh, soldiers, particularly if they are uh, the generals or the people in charge of the other soldiers. And uh, the aristocratic, more aristocratic uh, generals had been taken to the tower and were just imprisoned and then um, Charles was shot. 
and um, I think it's such a key background to which to understand her life is the idea that from a very, very young age, she was very aware of death disorder, of not just the civil wars being an abstract force. At some point, we have her family house being uh, like um, attacked and her possibly her we we know that there was one daughter but there could have been it's very hard to put a pin on who it could have been there are a lot of girls but many of them were married so we, it could definitely be her being paraded through the streets on the way to the local jail um so very very aware of all of these 17th century which seem like abstract political ideals but they were very much affecting her life at the time yeah i mean you've only got to look at the news to see how devastating any kind of um civil war is on you know on the same continent you know, amongst people who are very similar um in in background and upbringing it's yeah. incredibly yeah, upsetting brilliant poem where she writes that it like turns families against each other like uh suits of cards in a pack um so the idea that there's nothing really divide, dividing you other than whether you're red or black and you're gone yeah gosh yeah she put it put it so perfectly <laughs> um so very early on in her life margaret is is surrounded by powerful women um tell me about the time that she spent with queen henrietta maria yeah of course so we've got very young margaret and as you might have already guessed uh, she's going to go on to become a poet a writer a philosopher and a very early scientist and by the end of her life she's very very famous very well known uh, although not always particularly for her writing but she's a very well known figure and uh, in my book I make the argument that she should be known as a writer and a scientist but we have this interlude when she's 20 the civil wars have just happened her brothers are all fighting one of them is fighting in Ireland the rest are fighting in England and her older sisters are all married off so she's like what should I do? And she describes it in kind of terms which feel like the 20th century in a way. She describes as wanting to do her bit. Um, and to what extent that's true or to what extent she just wanted to get away from her family, we'll never know. But age 20, she made what must have been quite a terrifying journey to the exiled royalist court at Oxford. It had moved from London when everything had gone down in the House of Parliament. And Charles and Henrietta Maria had set up in Oxford, where they turned all of the colleges into a makeshift court. So it have different rooms all the students have been turned out so it sounds kind of amazing but um margaret decides she's going to be a lady in waiting and she goes off and she joins the court of henrietta maria at this point henrietta maria had just been traveling around the country trying to bring um a shipment of arms down to where the royalists needed them so she was a really involved part of this war effort she is described and describes herself as a she generalissima which i think is a brilliant title <laughs> so there are descriptions of her riding with her men as if she were almost a man doing directions she writes these long letters where she disagrees with charles the first um plans for how they're going to pursue the war she's incredibly incredibly perceptive and insightful and really really good uh you know, war generaless, as she would call herself. Yeah. And uh, Margaret must have read quite a bit of this. It was printed in illicit royalist newspapers that we think she must have had access to. And maybe that's the reason she wants to go join her is because she's this kind of icon of female power. And then she goes to join her. By the time she joins her, Queen Henrietta Maria has kind of left her life of, you know, swashbuckling fun because she's very heavily pregnant mm -hmm. and is just living in court. And Margaret becomes a very, very shy, very anxious lady in waiting. She was a very shy child, always describes how she would like wait, listening to the see if she could hear her elder sister breathing when she was asleep. She was always very worried that people were about to die or that things were going to go wrong. And she couldn't really speak in front of other people. And she turns up at this court and she um, later on in her life writes plays about her time when she was there, describing herself as Lady Bashful, which is really very tragic. Um, so it's this kind of mirage of female power and all of these sorts of things of being very involved in the big thing that was happening in England at the time. But at the same time, when she gets there, it's not quite as amazing or as exciting as she thinks. But then perhaps it becomes too exciting because... <laughs> Henrietta Maria, very heavily pregnant, decides to leave Oxford because it's all getting a bit close uh, and then ends up giving birth, but doesn't want to be captured by the parliamentarians. So has to flee England, leaving her newborn baby in someone else's arms. And uh, her and all of her lady in waiting get it on a boat and pretty soon it is being pursued and bombarded by uh, parliamentarian forces. And at one point, uh, Henrietta Maria 
tells the captain of the ship that if it looks like they're about to um, get hit, then they sh he should blow the ship up rather than let them be captured. So I think something which probably always stayed with Margaret uh, in her later writings is always terrifying uh, sea journeys and the idea that anything could go wrong at any one moment. Yeah. Gosh, I think people forget how how brave Henrietta Maria was yeah, completely and there's an amazing book by Leander Delisle which I was just looking at it's just on my bookshelf there yep. <laughs> it came out about last September and it's just absolutely amazing I think um it's very hard to overestimate like the amount uh of of importance she had both to the civil wars and then her bravery and the fact that she was still giving birth and uh just such a fascinating life and then so they then go to exile in uh initially just outside Paris and then they move somewhere else and um they set up like a court in exile um and Henry Maria is French uh she's also French Catholic which had caused problems uh, and did continue to cause problems, but they are there uh, for the duration of the Civil War until the Restoration. Amazing. So Margaret is is with Henrietta Maria. She's in this court in exile. It's this, uh, this sort of idea of very, very faded glamour there um, because it's not all fabulous and they don't have lots of money, even though this is a royal court. Um, Margaret at this time, she's very vocal about her thoughts on marriage um, at this time and throughout her life. What was it about William Cavendish, who she meets around this time, that enticed her to set aside those concerns? Yeah, so it's one of my favourite stories. So she was always very shy, so got to this court and couldn't really say anything, made worse by the fact she couldn't speak any French. So that would compound your shyness. Yeah. And she wasn't Catholic as well, so she was cut out immediately from a, a, a new type of social circle. Very, very young, very, very shy. And you're right, uh, in her later life, from about the uh, 1650s onwards, so not too far off this point, uh, would continually write plays and poems and prose romances and letters, all about how she thought marriage was a worse deal for a woman than it was for a man, and that a sensible woman shouldn't get married because men take away their agency, their power, they tell them what to do. Um, this all sounds very modern, and you might think that I'm being anachronistic, but I'm really not. She did write these things. <laughs> and <laughs> she is in uh, Paris Saint-Germain, so the exile court just outside of France. And one day a man turns up with an absolutely ridiculously ornate carriage and two beautiful horses. And he turns up looking incredibly flamboyant, like a dandy. And he turns up and he gives the horses over to Henrietta Maria in a little display of like wealth and court, like courtly nurse and everything like that. And Margaret thinks, oh, oh, I quite like him. <laughs> so she kind of fallen in love with his flamboyance and his amazing displays of... Um, well, it was thought to be wealth at that point. Actually, it was a display so that he could, his creditors would lend him more money if they thought he had enough money to give away horses for free. So it's actually a display of how broke he is. Um, <laughs> she kind of falls in love with this image of um, kind of an incredibly flamboyant man. He's three decades older than her, has been married once before, has three daughters and two sons, and his wife has recently died. And he is in exile because he had been leading... Uh, an army at the Battle of Marston Moor which had gone horrifically wrong due to a misunderstanding with Prince Rupert and who is another civil war figure uh, very important and uh, William had had to go into exile afterwards there's some debate about whether he'd had to go into exile because he'd handled the battle so badly or if he went into exile because he was embarrassed but then because he was in exile he didn't have a chance to uh, repair his reputation so his civil war record really suffers and he's kind of in disgrace by the time he turns up and him and Margaret start exchanging letters for love poems. So he would write more than we think over the time period. There are over 70, I believe. They're all in the British Library. He would write more than one love poem every single day for the duration of their courtship. And they're all beautifully weird. They're kind of, um, <laughs> if you imagine a John Donne poem written by somebody who is a bit cruder and doesn't quite have the same poetic sense. That's how they would describe them. They're quite bad poems, but they're really sweet. At one point he writes, old, um, what does it go? Old and dry wood makes the best fire in a, in a bit to try and like explain that he's not too old to marry her. And she writes these really touching love letters back. They're incredibly shy. She's always saying, you know, I cannot display my affection for you. Or she says, um, she's always apologizing for things. So she's like, I'm so sorry, you probably can't read this. Please lay the fault of my handwriting 
handwriting on my pen, which is a complete lie. Margaret has some of the worst 17th century handwriting in the world. Probably was dyslexic, which I very much sympathise with. And um, she was always writing these letters back to him. And um, on one occasion, she says, if you've got a plot against my health, because you sent me that poem so early that I was half asleep. <laughs> and it's just really sweet. They have this illicit quarter because she's not meant to be um she'd have to get permission from Henrietta Maria to get married and eventually eventually later that year they do get married in uh one of the Anglican chapels um very close to them uh but by that point there were already, already rumors around court that they'd already been married I mean it's all the poetry all of this sort of stuff and the the kind of the dandy cavalier and this this shy incredibly sort of literate um young woman uh, despite obviously having you know not not the best education and this is something i know she's very embarrassed about um the marriage of the duke uh, the eventual duke and duchess of newcastle it was this sort of how we know them uh, the yeah. cavendishes we know them as the newcastles it's it's always been one i found very romantic um especially this idea of him actually supporting her in her desire to learn and and her her writing and this this sort of image of them looking through telescopes together and the endless poetry I mean I'm you know I'm such a sucker for all of this am I romanticizing them a step too far what was what was their marriage really like and and what do we know about it yeah, so I think this is so key. Um, I think the popular image of it is incredibly romantic because in part it massively is. The love letters are unbelievably touching, just so sweet. And the poetry isn't great poetry, but it's, it is gorgeous in the way <laughs> that they continue to write it to her throughout her life. And in the later 19th century, 20th century, people became obsessed with this romance of the marriage because it is really sweet. But I think you're right to point out that maybe the romance doesn't lie in that point. Uh, in her later autobiography, Margaret writes quite, quite, you know, seriously and very honestly that William had probably married her because she was young and he wanted more heirs. The Civil War was a time which really proved to people that only having two sons probably wasn't enough if they were going to go off and fight. And he writes, she writes in her autobiography saying he, he married me because he wanted he wanted more sons. Uh, crucially, that didn't happen. And we can go on to talk about that later. But after that, their relationship is still incredibly, incredibly close. So they move from Paris Saint-Germain, they then travel a bit around the continent, go to The Hague, end up in Antwerp, in Rubens, the painter's old house, which William rents off his widow for kind of a cheap price by managing to persuade her to leave and let them come in. It's all kind of brilliant. So they're in this gorgeous house, it's utterly beautiful, uh, with a central courtyard, lovely stonework, and they're with William's brother, who's also called Charles. Uh, one problem I have in this book is the number of people called Charles cavendish or mm. charles lucas um you could get lost but it's okay <laughs> um, <laughs> but then they set up this kind of academy for margaret so margaret had been born when women's education uh was not necessarily at its height that actually it becomes it become uh, it becomes a much more discussed topic about 50 years later uh so she's born when it wasn't really um something that was very much of concern to parents and it's not that she didn't have any education she certainly learned how to read she certainly read a lot we know she must have read an absolute ton of Shakespeare an absolute ton of John Donne and she always said that she could ask her older brothers if there was anything she really wanted to know because they would have been properly educated but she didn't have a, a comprehensive education certainly nothing on the level of what Charles and William would have had and Prior to the civil wars, they'd set up a kind of patronage, uh, kind of academy. It's called the Welbeck Academy now, uh, the Welbeck Group or something like that. And um, uh, they were patrons of really, really famous thinkers like Ben Jonson and Thomas Hobbes. So these big names from the 17th century. And on the continent, Thomas Hobbes drops in. They have dinner with Thomas Hobbes and Rene Descartes and another philosopher called Pierre Gassendi. So they've got this whole network of, of, of patronage and they set up this academy to teach Margaret things. So Charles buys her a scale model of the solar system in order to be able to teach her about that, which is just gorgeous. And we have like the receipt of him ordering it. Uh, they buy microscopes they buy all of these things in order to be able to teach her about how the world works and while she's there she starts writing so this is her first book we think after the love letters and after her baby books which are now lost and it's called the world's olio so it's actually the third which is published because she had to leave it uh, in antwerp when she goes to london later which is a whole other story <laughs> but um 
and she's writing she'll write something being like my husband's told me this but here's what I believe so she wasn't necessarily just parroting his opinions she was being taught how to think and how to uh about so much about the world and it's really touching so that is incredibly romantic I think um maybe I'm just a nerd but I think it's gorgeous and it kind of it's the way that her her thought and her writing enters into the world is always via him so he supports her publishing he writes poems for the beginning of her um books one in which he calls her uh, a pure wit which is where the title of my book comes from <laughs> um but I don't know are we romanticizing it too far it's definitely a question so in later years everyone's always only ever stressed historians uh much of what we know about Margaret was lost for a while she wasn't really read and historians would only really stress her relationship with her husband because she wrote his biography about the civil war and that was the only thing that was really talked about and read and in my book I try to you know draw her life back out and talk about that and they did have an incredibly close relationship but later on in her life Margaret is still writing about how marriage is much worse for a woman than a man she's evidently writing about power struggles that were happening in her own marriage and she's always writing about how difficult it is often for a woman to enter a new family and crucially uh so she goes to London in 1651 after they've been married for quite a while she goes to London to try and get back some of William's estates. So the protectorate and the parliamentarian government had seized uh, royalist, uh, royalist, anyone royalist, their estates. Royalist, they've nicked his stuff. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> and as his dependent, she can go back and try and claim some of his um, money, in, like a, a percentage in order to be able to live off. Uh, she actually doesn't get any because they tell her that she married him knowing he was a delinquent, which I think is a great line. Um, but while she's there, she publishes her first book, which is Poems and Fancies, and then later Philosophical Fancies. But whilst she's there, William is writing this poetry, which um, he was sending to her, which has an inkling of the fact that he feels he's been betrayed. So he writes about her cold heart turned world, went against him. He also writes about servants turning spies and telling him things about what she had been up to. And it's very, very hard to take biographical details from poetry. It's very, very hard in the absence of any other evidence to to guess at what we're seeing. But I suggest in the book that perhaps she had betrayed him somehow and perhaps with his brother, which was who she was in London with. Gosh, I mean, that that's like, you know, if you like you say, if you're looking at the, the poetry, yeah. it does seem to suggest that something um something, something was going on, going yeah. on. Uh, but it might not have necessarily been sexual it might not have necessarily been anything at all it might just been the fact that he felt that she was there with him he couldn't William himself couldn't go because he would have been arrested on site so it's really hard to pin out but pull out but I would say definitely not as uh plain sailing as uh all the historians might have liked us to believe yeah wow well, this is one that people are going to have to buy your book and, and read read more into this because it is it is some juicy stuff. But I want to come back to her work. Um, well, you mentioned that her writing is first published at this time when she's when she's in London. But how on earth did a woman go about getting published in the 17th century? Such a good question. So, yes, her first book comes out in 1653. It's called Poems and Fancies. And on its title page, it says by... At this point, she is a Marquess, it says, but there's some debate about her title because titles have been seized during the Civil War. But uh -huh. it says, basically, by Margaret Cavendish in huge letters on the title, like right on the title page on the frontispiece. And this was really unusual. So women in the 17th century, it was not unheard of for them to be published. So Amelia Lanyard had written a, a book of poems and religious translations, which she had dedicated to female patrons. And this had happened sometime earlier. Then a woman called Lady Mary Roth, who was the niece of Philip Sidney, so a more famous kind of late Renaissance poet. Uh, she had published a prose romance with her own name on it, but then had had to retract it and say that she hadn't meant to publish it because it had caused a whole debacle and she circulated the latter, latter parts in manuscript only. But both women and men of aristocratic lineage or even if they just wanted to protect their modesty would mostly circulate things in manuscript. So all of the very well known works we know from this period were initially circulated in manuscripts so John Donne's poems weren't, weren't published until after his death uh, ditto George Herbert ditto a lot of Sidney's work or his sister uh, arranged them to be published after his death um, but there's a lot of so manuscript publication 
is not necessarily publication in the sense that it was printed via a printing press, but it still very much was publication in the sense that it was dissemination. Uh, This work could be read and it would be copied out and seen. But to actually choose print publication was quite radical, not just for a woman, but for someone of any any gender who, especially for someone who, um, you know, was by this point married into the aristocracy and was a woman and had to protect her modesty and was doing this in the middle of a civil war whilst her husband was on another other continent and women who had published at this point had normally gone for either to be anonymous and said published by a lady or they had published under their own name but under very very safe subjects so kind of mother's advice books to children uh which is kind of a genre which is a really fascinating genre but all about how to raise your children or along the lines of religious poetry uh, or some translations yeah. and Margaret comes out with her name in huge letters and it is a book about poetry about atoms about fairies about the civil war and about her own life and she's she's not taking any prisoners she's it's a very very bold move and it's a bold move which causes quite a lot of uproar in London at the time so uh there are amazing letters Dorothy Osborne is writing to her fiance at the time secret fiance they weren't allowed to get married but she writes being like pray if you can send me a copy of Margaret of Newcastle's poems I really need to read them and then she sends another letter being like don't worry I've read them and she's mad <laughs> Because she's not writing in a in a traditionally female area. She's yeah. wandering way out of her way out of her lane. And it's not even out of a traditionally female area. It's completely out of like known science at that time. So it's called Poems and Fancies. And much of the poems are about this idea of atomism which is hard to explain in the sentence and I'm going to give it a go but it's the idea very 17th century if you think of like pre-Newtonian science anything was up for grabs the whole world such an exciting time the whole world was ready to be explained and nobody was certain about anything so science and philosophy were really really open genres where um almost anything could be believed and it sounds too ridiculous to us now but it's a fascinating period of history and atomism coming from Epicurean ideals, um, was the idea that everything in the world could be boiled down to tiny little atoms which move randomly. And obviously now we think, oh, maybe they had a point. Um, So all matter was atoms and they all move randomly with absolutely no control over them. So it's a doctrine which calls into question theology at the time. It's a doctrine which calls into question so many things that had been held really really solid and other people who had written about atomism in English rather than French or Latin had always tried to couch it in terms of saying obviously I still believe in God but here's how this could be compatible. Margaret says none of that and it's quite a dangerous thing to do so she's not just being radical for a, for, for a woman she's being a really radical thinker who wasn't that bothered about maybe courting atheism this is something she goes on to do later in her life. She does eventually move away from atomism into a, a different uh, doctrine of philosophy which we now call vital capitalist materialism um and if this sounds dry i promise you it actually isn't it's all entirely radical and really fun um and the poetry is actually amazing in this initial volume she describes how um always using very like feminine kind of visual language so she describes how the whole world could be boiled down into an earring i'm holding my earring now um and then she said like if if everything is made of atoms then there could be an entire another world made of tiny tiny atoms inside a woman's earring just gorgeous gorgeous using a kind of feminine visual language and iconography to explain the entire world yeah she doesn't she doesn't shy away from the fact that she's a woman in her writing yeah. it's not you know she's not sort of pretending to be anything other than she is um I'd like to compare your book so as I was reading it it put me very much in mind of the excellent work on Afro Bane by Janet Todd oh, so <laughs> I, I, I'm glad that you like that book as well so really it, it felt I could feel the feel the two of them partnering up um so both Both of your subjects are women who, if we're brutally honest, we could write what we absolutely know for certain about these women on the back of an envelope. Um, So both of you have delved into their writing to tell their story, which I I think is a sort of as a literary biography and literary criticism is a brilliant approach. But I wanted to ask you, how laborious was that as a project? And how much do you think Margaret reveals of herself? really truly in her work 
think that's such a good question. I was just thinking, could you put everything you definitely know on the back of an envelope? And you make a very good point. I think because I've I've read so much yeah, and you begin to explore so much from her own work that you do forget that we often, you know, we don't even know the exact date she was born. Yeah. Um, and no, I think it's such an interesting question. So I do think so much of Margaret is revealed from her own writing. So we have poems and fancies in 1653, philosophical fancies the same year, from that point onwards. So she writes 23 volumes in total. It's just a huge number. And most of these aren't now available in modern edited editions. So you have to read them either in physical editions in the British Library or a lot of Oxford and Cambridge colleges have them. Or you have to read them on um, Early English Books Online, which is my favourite website in the world. Okay. <laughs> um, uh, and so you're reading like page scans and you're trying to figure out so much about her through this. Um, I wouldn't describe it as a laborious project because I found it utterly fascinating and kind of incredibly moving at points. Um, I th- most of my friends know this and I'm going to sound utterly deranged over a podcast saying this but I, I began to dream of Margaret Cavendish quite obsessively and I was dreaming that I was having conversations with her about things <laughs> um so I think I, very much I get you <laughs> entered into her world through her work and um I think she reveals so much of herself through her work so even in her first volume it's incredibly autobiographical she writes poems about um a woman marrying a man much older than her in a chapel and she's describing herself in amazing jewels and you know that that was what she wanted and it's what she imagined but she couldn't have been married in amazing jewels because they were so poor at the time uh she writes poems very very moving funeral poetry for her mother who died while she was in exile her brothers who died during the civil war just always always drawing attention to her autobiography so that's one way which i think you find so much out about her through her work rather than through what's necessarily been recorded elsewhere but then I think the other way is the fact that she's always writing about her own opinions so you know she has these things called sociable letters which come out in 1664 I think uh definitely actually 1664 and um they're a group of like semi-fictionalized letters that she pretended she wrote and sent to friends and that friends send back um but they are mostly fictional and she has comprised them to make them a volume and in it she writes these letters about um how much she hates pregnant women or how much she hates children or how she hates women who dedicate their whole lives to buying new clothes um (laughs) and all of these things you're like why are you writing that why have you chosen to say that and all of these things obviously are indicative of what was going on in her life at the time so it becomes kind of like detective work um but I can't claim uh sole credit for having done that like not at all because she's had a couple of amazing biographies before me the best of which which is Katie Whitaker's Mad Match came out in the early 2000s and so both Katie spent a lot of time in the Nottingham archives, which I also spent quite a lot of time in, um, which was really fun. And you end up finding a lot of details from things you wouldn't really expect to. So about like land deeds and when things were signed over to her, like what fight was she having with her husband then to get that signed over yeah. to her? Or uh, we have amazing medical records for her. That's the one thing we really, really are really lucky with is medical records for her and her family are insane. Just amazing detail um and like the horrible things they were prescribed like you had to um sprinkle powdered frogs on your food (laughs) yum (laughs) Yum. um so yeah I think she reveals so much about herself and I also think there is a lot of detail we can get out of things where you wouldn't really expect to find it um so it was uh like an incredibly fun process and one where I did did start dreaming about Margaret Cavendish (laughs) I, honestly Francesca I don't think you're the you're the only you're not the first you won't be the last person yeah. to fall in love with their their subject yeah. and to have them impose themselves on your every waking and not waking hour but um let's talk about her contemporary reputation so not you know 400 years later thinking that she's just a marvel clearly um she was something of an oddity, let's be honest. Um, and she was commented on by both Peeps and Evelyn. And even Mrs. Evelyn had something to say about Margaret Cavendish. Yes, I think at one point she says, um, she say there's sober people in Bedlam. I think she really yeah. do. <laughs> Along those lines. 
<laughs> um, so yeah, so she has this amazing reputation. So the restoration happens in 1616, at which point um, they, her and William return to London. William returns earlier, Margaret comes later, having packed up all of their things and also having been left in security for their debts, which is a bit rude from William, if you ask me. <laughs> Uh, so they turn up and they're kind of uh, living partly in London and they've got two very big houses, Bolsford Castle and Welbeck. And they are, you know, try- they've been massively ransacked during the wars, trying to put them all back together. Um, and then in 1665 and 1667, they spend quite a lot of time in London. And Samuel Pepys, obviously the most amazing restoration diarist, describes uh, at one point saying that the whole... Uh, The whole story of this lady is romantic and everything she does is romantic. And he described uh, her um, carriage parading through London and being pursued by a mob of about 100 children desperate to catch a glimpse of her. At another point, she goes to court and everyone trying desperately to catch a sight of her. At another point, that spring, she goes to the performance of her husband's play, The Humorous Lovers, a play by him, but everyone thought it was by her because she was more of a celebrity at the time. And she was wearing a dress that was cut to below the level of her nipples, which she'd attached nipple tassels to. Um, <laughs> so naturally, nobody could stop looking at her at all. Um, so she becomes this like this kind of creature. She's described as being in a dizzying monochrome of like black and white with silver tassels everywhere. And we're always like, why? Why did she become such a an oddity, such a celebrity? Um, uh, I think there's a thing coming out at the moment which is about to call her a 17th century it girl, which I kind of love. But yeah. um, like, how did this happen? And the idea is really her fashion was absolutely outrageous. So she yeah. writes from a very early age about how much she loved clothes and um, how she liked to design her own things and never wear the same thing as every anyone else. And so she's known for writing. She's known for being incredibly bold and wanting to write. By this point, she's slightly being more taken seriously as a thinker. So even though people are still being very rude about her, they'll say, you know, she can talk very well about philosophy, (laughs) even if they do think she's a bit mad. Um, And it's this combination of highly literate, but also vaguely odd woman who's not doing normal social things and would rather talk about philosophy late into the night in her closet, as one letter describes, uh, and also wearing the most outrageous clothes that she becomes a very early celebrity. Everyone knew who she was. She appears in countless letters and not always you can't always believe them because at one point it says that she turns up to the theater in a chariot pulled by eight white bulls um and I did go down a rabbit hole in my research trying to work out how many white bulls there were in England at the time (laughs) it probably couldn't have happened (laughs) I I just think of her like I mean she's Gaga isn't she she's Lady Gaga she really is in a a dress made out of meat and yeah no one you no one can ignore that nobody can not comment on it it's always going to be the thing that people talk about and it does seem that you know for all of her talent and for all of how incredible she was she just couldn't be ignored that yeah she she was just like a figure who was such who loomed so large in the contemporary imagination it's a very different world if you think about it uh the, the idea of who could be a celebrity was much narrower she was a duchess she had everything going for her and she just was famous and people did continually say that she uh was somebody says um i'm convinced she only didn't go to bedlam because she was too rich to be sent thither and then uh returns um the next line goes um but nonetheless she conveys that title to wherever she lives which is absolutely brilliant (laughs) so everyone thought she was mad um so it's not necessarily a kind of adulatory fame at all a lot of men are interested in her purely because they think she's beautiful, um, which is maybe why Mrs. Evelyn is so, so rude about Margaret, is because her husband could not stop visiting her. Oh, my goodness. Um, well, she was she was a phenomenon. Um, I... I could talk about her all day and um and I'm like. not letting you go I'm not letting you go yet but we we're getting to the end of Margaret's life so she dies very suddenly at yeah. only 50 years old I mean which is no age at all now and it wasn't even really an age then if she not you know notwithstanding childbirth and all of those dangers um let's talk about her legacy how widely read were her works in the years that followed her death yeah, so it's such a good question. So she dies in 
in uh, 1673 and uh, she is buried in Westminster Abbey which is kind of gorgeous so she's there and you can go see her and there's an effigy of her on the top line next to William and there's a line underneath which goes you know uh, Margaret Cavendish wise witty learned lady left behind no issue uh, other than her books is um, basically what it says and so she dies and then People, there's a couple of volumes of letters to her and about her, which her husband collects and publishes. So she has this kind of posthumous, very adulatory uh, reputation for a little while. And then after that, her works are really not read at all. So we enter into the early 18th century and are very, very much rapidly dropping out of, well, you know, they weren't in print by the time of her death, much of them, uh, but very much not being read. And if they were read, only the most random things are being read. So she appears in a couple of magazines, one's called The Connoisseur or something, where they're discussing her and they're discussing, like, you know, learned women poets. And they tend to just quote the most random things from her work. At one point, they quote something she wrote a half throwaway line she wrote about women going to boarding school, which for some reason is one of the only things that survived through the 18th century. Or they quote one of her poems about melancholy and then people say, oh, it's kind of like Milton. And then they claim that actually she might have influenced Milton, which is such a lie because it happens after Milton. If there was influence, it did go the other way. So her reputation becomes incredibly muddied and she appears in a couple of things which talk about female poets, but always only as if she were mad. So all of these apocryphal stories start to come up. So she's described as always sleeping with a little bell in her hand and surrounded by female attendants. So that if she had an idea for her poems in the middle of the night, she could wake them all up and they could write it down, which didn't happen at all. <laughs> Uh, and it's completely apocryphal. So all of these things start popping up and pretty soon we have the um, the designation Mad Madge, which uh, probably comes from like this really rude uh, poem written after her death, which calls her a whore. Uh, Welbeck's illustrious whore is the line, um, which I think is kind of cool, but I, I'm not sure she would have thought so. Um, and so rapidly she begins to drop out of a kind of public consciousness and if she is there it's only as mad so it's not really her work is not really paid attention to and it's just the image of the very famous very 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 silly mad woman this persists into the 19th century where actually Charles Lamb who writes essays at Elia uh, actually like declares a love for her but it's quite clear he could have only read uh, things that were um included in anthologies rather than her whole works, which were still in Oxford colleges. Uh, so all of her books have been given to Oxford colleges in the Bodleian, but people weren't necessarily reading them. This persists throughout the whole time. And then gradually people become more and more interested. It's a kind of revival of interest in women's poetry, but they also at the same time would, you know, quote her work and then cut out all of the like raunchy or interesting bits. So somebody edits her work towards the tail end of the 19th century and um, is quite Quoting one of her songs she writes in her play The Convent of Pleasure, which is a play, one of the earliest plays to non, so it's not necessarily to do with uh, like titillating male desire, it's a play which just stages lesbian desire in a non kind of ooh way, which actually <laughs> I, that was incredibly ineloquent of me to put, but it's uh, like a non titillating idea of like lesbian desire. So it's a really interesting play, and um this man quotes one of the songs from her and then cuts out all of the imagery to do with lesbian sex. Of course. And so she's always being like kind of butchered and uh, cut up or mostly overwhelmingly remembered for what she wrote about her husband. So she's always remembered as a really faithful wife who recorded her husband's civil war exploits in a biography, which was then tra translated into Latin. So that became like the only text of hers, which was read. This persists in the early 20th century where Virginia Woolf is able in her very famous lecture, A Room of One's Own, to call her a giant cucumber. And <laughs> in her favorite line in the world, a bogey to scare clever girls with, um, <laughs> which I absolutely love. <laughs> And it's kind of easy to say Virginia Woolf was being daft, and she was a bit, but she also does describe her as being like quixotic and noble and brilliant and everything. But Virginia Woolf would have only actually been able probably to read edited extracts and anthologies and the Charles Lamb commentary. So while she's being very witty, it's not necessarily a full picture. Um, I always feel awkward disagreeing with Virginia Woolf, but she didn't have the right <laughs> stick. Um, and then this carries on, and then she has a biography in the 1950s, and from that point, although that biography is quite flawed, things are on a steady upward trajectory, but even in the late 1970s, she's still being described as schizophrenic and mad and everything. So it's, it's really interesting, and then she kind of... Um, 
is definitely a figure that like second wave feminist literary criticism really is able to get teeth into and I think the time is very very ripe for a kind of full reappraisal where we don't just have to look at her reputation and what everyone said about her at the time nor do we have to you know uh, say uncritic uncritically that she was amazing or that her philosophy was absolutely amazing I, I do think it is really well worth reading and is a very coherent corpus if you do read it from beginning to end but I think the time is ripe for like real critical engagement with her work and also for a wider audience to be treated to it so there's amazing stuff going on in academia at the moment with lots of Margaret Cavendish studies and an edited 21 volume I think edition of her complete works is is due to come out soon that's going to be fantastic do you think it's I mean we've, we've touched on sort of the the second wave feminists and sort of very much how how that has shaped the way that we look at a lot of um a lot of female writers who went before would it be fair to call Margaret Cavendish a feminist writer I know it's been disputed and it's been hotly debated uh, and the whole idea of you know is she a proto-feminist is she a feminist da, 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 da. should we hold her can we hold her up should we hold her up as a feminist icon I think it's such a good question so in the book I uh, very much weigh up the whole proto-feminist feminist debate and I end up discarding the term proto-feminist because I felt like it put her kind of on a timeline or a train tracks before feminism the idea that the only type of like things that could be perfectly called feminist thought came in the later 20th century and I thought I didn't want to put her before that because it's not like she's on a on a train track towards some greater perfection she's a huge part of feminist and women's history and a history of thinking about women as a separate class both politically and socially which doesn't necessarily need to be thought of as imperfect just because it came earlier uh how do we know that we won't all be proto-feminists in another 50 years uh was the kind of argument i wanted to make i think it's almost patronizing to call her a proto-feminist but i know that i might uh i know that many people would disagree with me and i'm happy to be disagreed with but should we call her a feminist thinker is something I found incredibly interesting. So she is one of the very early English thinkers and writers to talk about women as an entirely separate class, both politically and socially, and to have different needs and to be affected in different ways by political decisions or political uproar or by the very basic things like marriage and childbirth. So she's always talking about women as a separate class, which is so interesting, or a separate group, which is kind of a, a central tenet of feminist thought is to think that things affect women differently. And that is really crucial. And that's what everything else stems from. from. So I wanted to argue, yes, because I think she is. She's always talking about how marriage is awful for women. She's always talking about childbirth, which um, she's always talking about. And she's always writing about... Um, how women are affected by what men do and how they might not have she describes them as like prisoners she also says at one point we women are miserable um so there's a definite feminist quote unquote awareness there the difficulty comes from the fact that often she would write things which we now really wouldn't consider feminist so she'll say something and then she always wrote in dialogue often in her plays particularly so somebody will say the exact opposite and it's hard people have said it's hard to work out exactly what side she was on and it isn't at all if you read her whole body of work it's very clear what side she's on um but at other points you know she was a royalist she was very very privileged uh although it's easy to say that as an aristocrat she was privileged her life was actually marked by you know it was not always the easiest uh war poverty disorder all of this was going on and you could argue that maybe she wasn't a perfect feminist because of that and because her feminism didn't always uh think about women who were lower down the social class than her but i would argue we can think of her as a feminist figure and I think it's really important to and I think she should be included in so many histories of English feminism and anthologies and thought of in those terms like a kind of Mary Astle figure um, but whether or not we should hold her up as a feminist icon I'm not entirely sure I think it maybe flattens her a little bit I think we should embody her and her contradictions and accept them and think about them rather than just putting her on a poster or a tote bag um, that being said I quite like a Margaret Cavendish tote bag if anybody wants to make one <laughs> <laughs> okay well I'm sure I'm sure we can arrange that that sounds like we, we need to get the merch out there um yeah woman is not perfect feminist shocker um, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> listen margaret has been overlooked she's been ignored she's been forgotten and definitely misunderstood so if i gave you 30 seconds to reintroduce margaret cavendish duchess of newcastle to the world what would you say i would 
Oh, such a good question. <laughs> I think I would say um, Margaret Cavendish is a radical 17th century poet, science and philosopher who will upend any ideas about what you had, about what the 17th century is or what was going on. Uh, she makes it seem incredibly new, exciting and novel. And she's writing in genres and in ways which have become no less exciting for us to read them now. Um, she'll take your brain and tip it inside out. <laughs> That sounds good to me. Pure Wit, The Revolutionary Life of Margaret Cavendish is published on the 14th of September by the wonderful, wonderful Francesca Peacock. Do get yourself a copy. Thank you so much for joining me today, Francesca. Thank you so much, Charlie. Thank you. <laughs> Our incredible guests give us 45 minutes of their time to join us and talk about their work or their new book. This is just a small taster. As a result, we have launched our very own bookshop on bookshop.org, where you can find our guests' latest books, you can support them, and you can support us on History Hack. 10% of every sale via our bookshop supports the podcast and allows us to keep going and bring you more top-of-the-line guests. You can find our bookshop at bookshop.org forward slash shop forward slash history hack, or search for us in the shop section. Thank you so much for your continued support. We really appreciate our listeners and supporters. So make sure you get down to the bookshop and grab yourselves a new book.